Assembly Theory and the Drop 45 Drive Lane. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Ah! <laughs> Not a normal show, folks. But, nevertheless, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you totally not live and with no video from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. This will be our Christmas episode this year. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas to all. Happy holidays. Uh, So... We had planned to have our good buddy or good friend from the Discord, Martin, on. He has uh, Me- Megalithic Martin has uh, Mega has some, Martin. Yeah, has some good stuff to discuss, like maybe a couple shows worth of of material. But Kyle has injured himself somehow. Sleeping. <laughs> it's the most dangerous thing you can do, folks. <laughs> so he's really been. Uh, I mean, ho- kind of hobbling around, so we, I, we weren't even really able to do the show. We had to cancel Cosmographia, and yeah, yeah so. I woke up uh, with, like, a crick in my neck, and then it just got worse and worse, and then and then uh, I was trying to, like, fix it on Sunday night, <laughs> and I made it worse. Oh. And then <clears throat> Monday morning, I woke up, and it was like, oh, my God. Pinched nerve, and... Uh, by two thirty in the afternoon, I was at work. Uh, I just had like excruciating pain down my arm, and that was like an hour and a half from home. So then I started driving home, and it just oh my god, some of the worst pain ever for me. Like that was insane. Uh, yeah, just, yeah. So he contacted me, and he was like, "Dude, I'm like I can't. I don't think I can." You know, I can't, uh, I'm not sure what's going on. And then Laura contacted me and she's like, he better not do any shows, right? <laughs> she's like, I'm really concerned with him. So I, we've, we basically just had to put, but at this point, he's on meds, he's totally <laughs> high. <laughs> and we decided we wanted to do something. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm in pain no matter what. So I might as well do a show. But yeah. I just, th- this is one reason why I didn't want video because I'm just like, <clears throat> yeah, to, like adjust my. S- the position I'm sitting in and my head is yeah he's just... kind of in this weird tilted position so it's anyway no my video. arm hurts <laughs> <laughs> really bad because of my neck <laughs> so yeah no video uh we're doing this old school uh and it's kind of nice yeah it is kind of nice uh but we do have some other updates to tell you guys about number one I just wanted to say that the snake force is amazing. Like this, uh, a good friend of ours in the discord, uh, mystic chick or Georgia. Uh, I hope she's okay with me saying that. I think she is, uh, her, she lives in Australia and her house the other day, she just told us, she's like, my house just burned down in a brush fire. Right. And so the, the some of us on the discord urged her to like we're we're like hey like let us help you out you know start start something and so she started to go fund me and i posted it on twitter and we told some people about it and you guys you know this you guys in the snake force just came through in an amazing way and i just i just wanted to say thank you so much for all being so awesome she is like yes that is really going to help her out because they basically i mean no one you know no one perished and i think that their animals all survived as well but or at least the cats did i don't know about they had a bunch of animals but yeah their house was burned like you know an Mm. australian brush fire and then you guys just came through uh over the past couple of days donating to the gofundme so i really appreciate that you guys are amazing that is awesome and if you hadn't heard about that and you would like to donate i will put the links to the gofundme in the show notes for this episode so yeah, thank you guys so much for coming through on that. It's really helped her out, and it's just uh, it's just proof that it's you're amazing all amazing. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Yes. Uh, what else? Kyle's got some papers. Uh, there was a really interesting uh, Lex Friedman episode with uh, a guy talking about assembly theory, which most of it 
we don't understand. But <laughs> His we, name is Lee Cronin. <laughs> we wanted to talk a little bit about some of what was in that because it's really <laughs> interesting stuff. Um, but, and then we also have some emails. And, you know, I don't know how long this show's going to be. We're going to go until until basically Kyle needs to go lay down. And then, <laughs> 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 we're gonna I, stop. I, th- I think I think I'll be all right. I mean, I, I did. <laughs> he s- says this all the time. I did sit gentlemen. in here. I did sit in here for a while today already. <laughs> sitting sitting has been uh, one of the worst things to do. Standing is okay. Laying down has been the best because I can like prop my neck up in the right position to where I'm. It's like the least amount of nerve pinching. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but for some reason, sitting is like. The worst. And driving, so, yeah. So, yeah, well, driving ultimately is the worst. Yeah. Absolutely worst. Um, but it is also a sitting position. It is a so. sitting position, yeah. A stressful one. Anyways, I did sit in this studio uh, quite a bit today, did some work in here, so I'm, I think I'll be fine. That's, All that's right. That. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get to the papers or any other discussion... Um, no. Well, we, yeah, okay. <laughs> he's jumping the gun on the cues here. I thought you, I was dang, <laughs> trying to really get it, nail it. Okay. Let's do space weather news. <laughs> dang it. I didn't have it pulled up. Okay, here we go. Uh, let me make sure this is the right day. Uh, yes, I think, well, no. Now it is. Okay. (laughs) Chance of flares today from spaceweather.com. Don't be surprised if there is an M-class solar flare today. At least three sunspots have unstable magnetic fields teetering on the edge of explosion. Uh, And they list the numbers here. NOAA forecasters peg the odds of an M-flare at 40%. Any explosions today will probably be geo-effective. Two of the sunspots are directly facing Earth. Wow. And we have the best display of PSCs. In decades, here at spaceweather.com, we've been covering polar stratospheric clouds, or PSCs, for almost 25 years. This week's outbreak may be the best in decades. This evening, I have for the first time witnessed my first ever polar stratospheric clouds, which are so incredibly rare here in Denmark, reports Ruslan (laughs) Merkliakzavav. I rushed to the other side of Limfjord to capture this mesmerizing phenomenon. Limfjord's latitude is pl- uh, 56 degrees north, a full 10 degrees south of the Arctic Circle, where the clouds are normally contained. Indeed, PSCs have been sighted outside the Arctic Circle for more than four days in a row, making the outbreak remarkably long-lasting and sustained. Polar stratospheric clouds are a sign of extreme cold. They form when the temperature in the Arctic stratosphere drops to a staggeringly low minus 85 degrees Celsius. Then... And only then can widely spaced water molecules in the dry stratosphere coalesce into tiny ice crystals. High altitude sunlight shining through the crystals creates intense iridescent colors that rival auroras. I have never seen them so large and vividly colorful before, reports uh, Ronnie Tertness, who sent this sunrise photo from Bergen in Norway. The photos don't really justify the wonderful sight, he says. During a typical Arctic winter, PSCs appear no more than a handful of times, and the first sightings usually come in January. This week's apparition marks an early start and may herald many more PSCs to come. Current conditions, solar wind speed is 333.6 kilometers Ah. per second. The density is 3.49 protons per cubic centimeter. Sunspot number is 138, and the neutron count is minus 4.4% of the space age average so far below and the let's see the kp index is 0.67 which is very quiet and the 24 hour max was 1.67 which is also very quiet and that is your space weather news for the week and that is not what i was intending to do originally (laughs) but that's totally great job (laughs) so like i said we have plenty of emails to get to as well uh I mean, I think we're going to be able to discuss these concepts, the assembly theory and the papers for a while, but we also have emails we could get to. But before we get to anything else, because this is the Christmas episode, I had to to read this because somebody did send us a Christmas poem, (laughs) a Snake Bros Christmas. It's called Last Minute Snake Poem. (laughs) It says, brothers, I had trouble sleeping last night, so I got up and made myself useful. 
by writing this poem. Tis this time of year where we like to look back. Truth be told, this was inspired by L.P. McQuack. His poem was awesome. Am I up to the task? In search of the courage, I take a nip from my flask. His poem was of Christmas, mine only a bit. This is of demons and monsters that spit. Such a wide range of, wide range of topics we like to discuss, led by Brothers of the Serpent, the infamous Kyle and Russ. From space weather news and cool soundboard effects Hold up. to Swapcast with Grimerica and Uncharted X. While the Comet Research Group looks for that elusive big crater, intently we listen to Marty, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> Troy Bing brings the artwork, Kyle the music hooks, while Jeff searches the library for secret knowledge in books. As the Watcher is watching from his secret space station, somehow he saves lives, this man needs a vacation. <laughs> Without knowing, Russ recited a secret spell of the occult, then Pan unleashed a storm we know was all Marty's fault. <laughs> and if you send in a theory, make it an ace of a card, for Brother Kyle will come for you and skirp derp that shit hard. <laughs> Lest not we forget about our wise wizard Randall, where the Cosmic Summit openly stated they gave us all we can handle. <laughs> if you are into the Maya, give Luke Caverns a whirl. Oh shit, I forgot Laura. Please forgive me. Hey girl. <laughs> So take a slice of turkey, dip it in cranberry sauce. Merry Christmas, Snake Bros, and the entire Snake Force. Snake Snakes! Force. Snakes! <laughs> That's great. That's from Ed Fu, dude. This guy is awesome. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> You're a genius. Yeah. He says. Enjoy the holidays, everybody. Look after yourselves and each other. May 2024 bring us some awesome new discoveries toward these mysteries that bring us together. <laughs> Lots of love, warm and fuzzies from Ed Fu. <laughs> you, know, you need to post that somewhere, somewhere <laughs> it's, in public. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Laura. Hey, <laughs> Oh, well done, man. Yes, Thank you so great. much. Well I was up. I was rolling laughing when I yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, that was great. Okay. Is it time to get serious? Uh. <laughs> Assembly theory. So what is this idea? <laughs> we're we're gonna discuss this a little bit. We're still studying it. I, I might read some from the abstract a little bit, but uh Oh my god. That's that made it worse for me. So Well I, just just uh, Okay, yeah, yeah, I know okay, there's yeah, a couple yeah, of things. Yeah. I listened to this podcast on uh the Lex Friedman. Lex Friedman show and I was just blown away. I was working in the winery, no one around, no distractions. Yeah. And I just kept the the longer it went, the more I was just like, Oh my god. If you but, it it started out like what the hell is this guy talking about? Yeah, and it just slowly accumulated, and I started to realize like, wow, this is really interesting and something I've never considered, never heard anyone talking about anything like this. Apparently, the paper, because he's talking about a paper he recently published, and this guy is also he's published a lot of papers. He's a chemist. Anyway. Um, it it kind of like made everybody mad. That's kind of what he was joking about. Yeah, you know, the physicists got mad, the biologists got mad, the creationists got mad, and the evolutionists <laughs> got mad. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, I must be onto something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, which was just funny, but anyway, they. It's a great that podcast. Is down, I mean, it was, you know, I also want to point out that this is similar to other like sort of like one of the Comet Research Group's papers that got, you know, a lot of traction because it interested people. Yeah. And it was sort of a little bit out there. This is the same thing. Like, it had a lot of reactions, you know, like millions of people looked at it. It was downloaded over 200,000 times. So mm -hmm. uh, it's similar in that in that aspect. Yeah. So I think, I guess just to, to sum up the show, the, the, the show and the topics in the show – they go in a lot of different areas, not just specifically assembly theory, but it's just I, I just like the, every next topic that they discussed. I was like, wow, this is this is something Russ and I have talked about a lot or, yeah, you know, touched on these types of questions. Um, so I, was, I just I sent it to him and I was like, bro, we could do like probably a whole show just talking about this this concept. And then, you know, 
a week went by and I've pretty much forgot. I, I tried to explain it to a good friend of mine <laughs> and I, could, I did a terrible job. And I was like, man, I don't know if I could actually talk about this at all. <laughs> yeah. And so, and I, I get the idea listening to the, to the episode with, with Lech that, um, that this guy has the same problem mm -hmm. because he'll yes. be, he'll be saying something and he's got all these givens in his head yeah. that yeah. aren't clear. Right. And so at first and I, now I've, I'm listening, I'm on the, I'm my third listen to the show. So now I understand what's happening because he'll say something and you're like, what? what? Yeah. You know, and then you, as it, as it, as you go on, you find out, oh, he's he's got these like priors. Yeah. In his mind. And there's language in the paper that I'm like, I have never seen this word before. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, he's he's wordsmithing in there. Yes. Like creating verbs out of things. that shouldn't be. <laughs> yes. He's verbing words. <laughs> um, <laughs> <clears throat> I would say just as just to, in my the the way I understand it to simplify it in the greatest possible way. Four it's just, hours later, yeah, <laughs> it's just a a method of looking at things in terms of how they would naturally assemble themselves from smaller pieces. Yeah, and so I mean. Even to get there, scientifically, he has to, for example, define the word object. Yeah. Like, what do we mean by object in the universe? And they go on that, and this is like in the early parts of the podcast, too. Um, but basically, he's a chemist, so you could think about it in terms of a molecule. What is the least amount of possible steps that would have to be taken in order to create, you know, uh, a protein or something like that? Yeah, uh, and 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 there's that sounds simple enough, but there's all these implications in terms of what, uh, what sort of natural selection is. Yeah, and what it means for pre predicting the future or predicting other objects, the existence of objects. <clears throat> yeah, and he talks about it in terms of efficiency. And yes. you know some of this you recognize from physics as like the what is the least energetic action that mm -hmm. can take place path of least resistance right. for example yeah so the least number of steps sort of fits into that right least number of steps makes it more efficient and then they yeah. discuss higher probability of 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 uh, what's the phrase they use uh, having duplicate forms of this yes duplicate object. forms so then you end up with more of them and then. Also, like you were bringing up earlier when we were talking about this before we started the show, that uh, that the amount of times this can happen overcomes the decay rate of the objects themselves, right? And so mm -hmm. then you end up with a bunch of them, and then those things can combine <clears throat> further into more complex things. Right, and a lot of times he's talking about the, the size of complexity. Like, he uses these words like size. You know, he says that the Earth, for example, one of the things he says is the Earth is the largest thing in the universe. And then you find out later that what he means is the largest thing we know about in the universe, and it's large in terms of complexity, in terms of time, right? And so all of these subjects, like, you, you, you eventually, when you listen to him, you realize that he's got this, because of his work with assembly theory, he has this sort of altered way of looking at the yeah. entire universe. And to him, size means how many complex things are there in yes. the system and how much time has elapsed in that system where these complex things exist, allowing other massive, massively, like where you can basically with a, only a couple of steps arrive at an object that is incredibly complex because you are existing in a system with full a lot of, of complex, complex objects. objects. And so you so, only have to do three combinations and now you have a really right. complicated thing. So prior to this is yeah. like, if you take like the most fundamental building block uh, of, of things, in the universe and you put two of them together you've created a more complex building block now that building block exists and it becomes one of the building blocks yeah that's right and so as you get more and more complex building blocks they are also blocks to build with so that like what russ was just saying in a place full of complex already existing complex objects it takes few steps to create extremely com even more complex objects yeah um so, like, one of the things the, I thought the, of... So, so the point of, of the statement, just to clarify, yeah. the statement that the Earth is the most... is the biggest thing in the universe, it, meaning that it has, in terms of what we know, what we've observed, the most complex things on it. 
And in, yes, right. Which like, you know, in his, w- what he was saying is like basically humans are like this very complex biological life. So it is big. It's the biggest in terms of information. Yeah, that's right. It's a massive information object to uh, in our collection of information. Yeah, from what yeah. we've observed. Yeah. So, like one of the things I thought of because he was, and I don't know if he specifically meant this, but one of the things because he was, he would say things like, you know, we have, we have these, this. He also what another interesting thing that he talks about is the is that time is fundamental, mm-hmm. right? And you know some physics people don't like this because this they've got this there's this concept of like the multiverse whatever that you know that all things are possible all things that could happen do in this multiverse place uh and he's saying one of the things that he says it's really interesting is that the universe isn't big enough to contain the future because the future is so full of possibilities that that amount of information is not cannot be contained in yeah, the universe. There's not as it enough is. stuff in the universe to contain that information. Right. Which and this, is, I love that. This reminded me of something I saw recently, and mm-hmm. I didn't read all the stuff about this, but there's this, and this isn't a new idea either. Somebody in the, I don't know, in the, uh, maybe 1920s. I don't, rem- I don't remember exactly, but somebody came up with the idea that there's only one electron in the entire universe. That all because all electrons are basically this exactly the same. I have it right now, actually. <laughs> we all have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that all electrons have the exact same charge and the exact same mass. That the, it's just one electron. It's one object that has traveled back and forth through time and is now all of the electrons. That's cool. I, right? I, I immediately like this idea. Just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's only one. <laughs> and it has taken every possible place for an electron to take in the universe, right? Which you can do these this crazy math, like how what is the estimated age of the entire universe to go all the way to the end of time and then turn around and come back and then do the whole thing again, and then come back and do the whole thing again, and then they estimate the age at like 10 to the 180, something like that, years for this electron. That's how old it has to be. (laughs) (laughs) But any individual one that you're looking at is is one you know, iteration of the same electron, and this one's like only 10 to the 12, and that one over there is 10 to the 90, Uh, and you know, because it's all the same electron. And then when it's coming back in time, it's positrons, which is the... uh, the antimatter version mm. of an electron. So it's also all positrons. <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting. Man. But I think this doesn't quite work because, well, at least not with what we've observed because um, there's a lack of positrons, right? So where is this thing when it's coming back? <laughs> it, there must be the same number of positrons on the way if it, if it has to come back every time. Anyway, this idea... Uh, <laughs> kind of ties in with this because of this concept of like th- that that time itself is fundamental because time is required like he was talking about okay you can have a, a a sort of conceptual universe where and they talk about this at the very beginning and i'm going to get some of this wrong but there's a conceptual universe where objects can be complex because you're not putting in the constraints of where does the complexity come from but in the real universe complexity arises from the existence of time Right, you start out with very mm-hmm. fundamental things, and the only way to get more complex things is to have some of those fundamental things combine with each other. Then those combinations have to combine with each other, and this all takes time. And so, to have to construct a very complicated object, like for example, the internet, requires an enormous amount of combinatorial time <clears throat> in its past. You can't just arrive with this concept, yeah. right? And one of the ways that we've talked about this on the show multiple times is in the con- in the context of what would future civilizations think of some of the objects we have now after a collapse or some kind of cataclysm, right? The concept of quant suff is the loss of the complexity that's in of our ideas of whatever. ideas that we all hold and we sort of like we walk around with them all the time. That the the idea of what a what a phone is. 
aside from just being a communications object, the, the fact that you can get all this information from it, that it connects you to people all over the planet, that it's, you know, that you can play video games on it, that it's, that it's connected to computers, right? The idea of screens and, and, mo and swiping and all these concepts that are built in that have taken time to sort of build up. All that stuff takes time. You can't just show up with this object and have anybody expect to use it. You know, if you went way back in time with your phone, no, you wouldn't be able to explain it to anyone. Yeah. You could give them sort of very basic ideas, but who who on this planet knows everything about how one of these devices works? No one. No one knows all of the stuff required right. to con construct one of these, right? So we have these gigantic it's, it's, complexity architectures. That's, see, that's a really complex object to explain uh, in, <clears throat> in comparison to a pencil. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this before. This is the... Uh, yeah. I think it was Milton Friedman, the economist, yeah. that talked about like no one, and and maybe he was referring to somebody else who came up with this, but no one knows how to make a pencil. Yeah, <laughs> is this statement? It's like what? and a pencil's a, sim a simple seeming object, and yet you have. But he goes on. Mines yeah, and, he goes yeah. on to describe like all the different things that t it takes, like to to mine the lead or the whatever the pencil lead, and then like the the machines that are involved in that, and the you know, how to dig into, into the ground to get it, how to refine those materials. Yeah. And then the trucking and how to build the trucks that ship the materials and the, the logging and the, the saws and everything that yeah. comes into yeah. the whole Making thing. the rubber and the metal yes. for the, yeah. yeah. The rubber the and the paint. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much information <laughs> that it's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. No single person knows how to make a pencil. Mm -hmm. At least not the way that we make them, right? You could come up with something that's sort of, like a pencil, but like what he's talking about is like this particular object requires an enormous complex uh, knowledge uh, base. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it, and it, and and in terms of this, uh, what does he call it? But I can take a stick and and sharpen the end of it and stick it into the fire and have a rough a charcoal pencil. A charcoal yeah. pencil. <laughs> but you can't make the wood. I mean, we could yeah. go in deeper. Like you don't know how a tree is made. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. So this idea, so let's, I'm interested in why this upset so many people. I wasn't really quite able to grasp I, okay, that. Okay, so, so as far as I understand it, at, at the very surface level, it seemed like to people who were looking at this from the outside that he was saying God exists, mm. that there must be a creative yeah, force, just go around that there that. must be a, a you know, that, that there is something that had... Like, so why were the creationists mad? Because he didn't say God exists in the right way? Yeah. <laughs> that it was some kind of mechanistic, like, you know, uh, almost like uh, like statistical type of God or something. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it, I, I'm not sure, but <clears throat> but basically what he was saying is, is that, 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 that he's possibly got a key that this theory, assembly theory, is possible perhaps the key that can tell us how life became something like life uh oh sorry yeah. not that one <laughs> yeah that how life finds a way well, to I... be to come into existence yeah, at all okay and and uh that's as, that's probably as about as good as i can explain so, why it made people mad okay so the paper is called assembly theory explains and quantifies selection and evolution and the first two sentences from the abstract are, I mean, they were talking about this on the podcast. This is like, he said that so many people like picked it up, read the first two sentences of the abstract, and then got mad, yeah. right? <laughs> so from the abstract, scientists have grappled with reconciling biological evolution with the immutable laws of the universe defined by physics. These laws underpin life's origin, evolution, and the development of human culture and technology, yet they do not predict the emergence of these phenomena. There you go. Evolutionary theory explains why some things exist and others do not through the lens of selection. To comprehend how diverse, open-ended forms can emerge from physics without an inherent design blueprint, a new approach to understanding and quantifying selection is necessary. We present assembly theory as a framework that does not alter the laws of physics but redefines the concept of an object on which these laws act. Assembly theory conceptualizes objects not as, a, as point particles, but as entities defined by their possible formation histories. See, this is the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Formation histories. We got to get is, into that. Yeah. But 
we should take a break first. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but I think in there is another reason why it, it, it upset people because it's like, you know, the, the, the classic, like, I, I can just hear the physicists going, what does a chemist know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. About, yeah. You know, Chemistry like, is downstream <laughs> from physics. <laughs> That's right. All right. We'll, we'll be right back. <laughs> We're back, ladies and gentlemen, brothers of the Serpent Podcast, talking about things we have no comprehension of. <clears throat> Once again, as always, zero mistakes. Certificates of ignorance, almost always all wrong, all most <laughs> all the time. Russ definitely has a, a better grasp on this than I do. Thank you for uh, sticking with this this topic for uh, the past week. Yeah, while I laid in bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, so okay, so let's. Let's look at this concept where he... This is cool, right? Uh, AT, or assembly theory, redefines the concept of an object. Not uh, They conceptualize objects not as point particles, right? So not as electrons or protons or atoms or molecules, but as entities defined by their possible formation history. So this is where it gets interesting because of the idea that, that time is included in the concept of any object. Yes. And it's possible formation histories, as the abstract says, this allows objects to show evidence of selection within well-defined boundaries of individuals or selected units. So, in other words, the possible ways that any given object could have formed it basically gives it a history, you know? It's like you can think of it as like a browsing history or something. It's like, here's how you got here. And... All of that information is contained in any given object. And that's why he's saying that some of the objects we have on Earth and the Earth itself is the largest possible object because it has this enormous formation Formation history, history. Yeah. yes. So uh, cool. Yeah. So it's like every object essentially has a DNA yeah. code. Right. Where you could do kind of the same things that we're doing with the DNA where yeah. you're going back and finding out, oh, you know, these two objects combined at some point and yeah. they formed this other one and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, and this is why he's saying in assembly theory that time is fundamental, right? But 99% of that formation history is junk formation history. <laughs> it's, yes, <laughs> it's junk formation. <laughs> Just that's a joke. Yeah. A joke. He also he also talks about how you know, he and I think it may be in the abstract here somewhere. I don't want to read too much more out of the abstract cuz it just gets more I, and more. I, yeah. Uh but basically he's saying like this 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 sort of this can kind of remove this problem of randomness, right? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, that, like, a lot of times when trying to sort of hand wave their way past how did we get from basic elemental things to very complicated things like, uh, you know, proteins and amino acids is like there's a sort of hand wavy random. Random new yeah, mutation. Random, random combinations, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and he's saying, no, each object... Uh, any given object in the universe or in any place has a formation history. And in the formation history, you see how the selection works. This object is formed in this particular way because it requires the least amount of work, the least amount of energy. That makes it non-random. Yes. Right? In other words, there's the selection is, in some cases, built into the environment, and the environment itself is an object that has a formation history. Yes. Right? So all of this stuff you can begin to see, like, once you... Sort of, would you apply the theory universally? Yeah, yeah. You can start it to see supports how it, itself. Yes, you can see how it b begins to build a framework and of a way to look at the universe that's very interesting and can give you a lot more data. Right? So I think did, and I could be wrong about this, but maybe you you could correct me. But I think he did talk about like the idea of a random formation of an object. Yeah, and that most likely it's not going to have an. Uh, <clears throat> I can't remember what his term for it is, but a duplicity, like a multiple. There's not going to be multiples of them. Yeah. So yeah. you won't even know that it existed, most likely because there would only have been one. Yeah. And that it decayed before it ever 
Yes, that's right. So, so uh, there is a in the, in the paper in the early parts of the paper this 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 point this key point that is that object that is the least amount of steps and can like we were saying before form itself more rapidly than its own decay according to the laws of physics and in in, in conjunction with its environment it will tend to form itself a lot yeah and there will be a bunch of them and therefore they will sustain themselves and also become the building blocks of future objects yeah whereas it's, it, it says this approach enables us to incorporate novelty generation and selection into the physics of complex objects yeah. so novelty generation is a new like, object yeah yeah like how do you get novelty right without just sort of hand waving and saying random mm -hmm. you know uh and how do you get novelty that becomes non-novel it, yeah, it's like yeah. now it's normal like well how did this happen you know yeah. it requires a formation history and you know this concept of selection being uh like path of least resistance or as few as possible combinations and then in, in also in the podcast he talks about because i think lex brings this up you know he's like oh well people have brought up uh, uh cases where uh, things form in the in more steps than they n necessarily would have, and and the guy is like, mm -hmm. well, yes, but that's because you have to look at the environment that they're forming in. Usually, something isn't forming in some kind of like perfect vacuum where nothing else is happening. Copy number, I'm sorry, just ah. to go back, that's that's what it's called. Copy number is is how many times? How it's many of yeah. them are there, or you know, they're. That, that a bunch of them are going to be made. That's yeah. copy number. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Continue. So in a, in a situation where you know in, you can you can sort of mathematically come up with like well how many steps does it take for this particular molecule to form you know using chemical bonds or whatever, given you have all the exact right elements and stuff and you can come up with the fewest number of steps. But that's not the real world. In the real world, lots of things are happening. Many many different things are combining in different ways. And so sometimes the most efficient and fewer st fewest steps uh, taken to form something in that in particular environment is more steps than it would take in a perfect like isolation where it's forming all by itself. Yeah. In other words, when you're building a lot of things, more steps may be required to build some of those things than otherwise would be required because you're actually doing a whole bunch of things. Because not a just lot of thing. other things are being built more and they're more likely to be built in that environment. So it's yeah. Doesn't build the other ones as often or whatever. So they, right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And I think that's about as far as I can go in discussing this concept. <laughs> <laughs> I, the last thing I will say, and I, and again, this is going to be vague because I, I, I can't, I can't remember exactly all of the, the things that this guy was pointing out about this but the but there is a way to like like we were just discussing that when you apply this idea uh to the entire universe and the formation of the universe and all this it starts to he's basically saying like he's predicting it will solve huge problems huge questions in our understanding of the universe even though he, we haven't gotten there yet because coming up with these, uh, what did you call them, assembly? Uh, formation histories. For, formation histories of objects is going to be very hard. Like yeah. it's, it's not easy to come up with the formation history of a, like a, a plant cell or a human cell. Right. There, it's a massive amount of information, a massive amount of different objects that create this thing. Um, but it can be done. Yeah. Right? That, that, that we can start to compile the formation histories of, of, of objects and, and continue to build on it, that ultimately he's predicting huge advancements in our understanding of the universe by solving a whole bunch of big problems with what we call the standard model. <clears throat> uh, so, yeah, this, it's, he's making extremely bold claims about this and uh, makes a pretty good case for it in this... Uh, in this uh, podcast with Lex. Yeah. Uh, there's okay. So maybe there are a couple more things <clears throat> I can say about it. The two things that I thought of when reading this paper and listening to this guy, one, 
because I kept being reminded of the Feynman lectures and Feynman himself. But if you go back and listen to our uh, our uh, series on uh, the character of physical law, Feynman was inclined to describe the universe as a, a very large collection of tiny objects doing uh, basic calculations yeah. using physical laws, right? In other words, uh, that all the neutrinos coming off the sun and running into things are is, is a is a method for the universe to do a particular kind of calculation, right? And he he was he was attempting to show how gravity may work in this way, and how people were coming up with different ideas of, on how gravity might how does gravity make all the calculations. Right? How does the universe do the calculations for like this where we can like we can write this very simple formula? And he's like, but what's actually solving this problem yeah, all the time in real time yeah, with this very with all the crazy amount of variables around everywhere? Right. Yeah. So it's like in physics, you are looking at all these the interactions of all these tiny particles using usually very simple rules, and all these uh, tiny interactions that are going on are, are performing this enormous calculation that results in a very simple formula that you can write down, mm -hmm. you know, that like it's the inverse square yeah. based on the distance between the t centers of gravity, right? Yeah. And and all the other centers of gravity that are out there. <laughs> so this kind of reminded me of that, that, that what we're really talking about here is an enormous amount of information uh, that is, that is being uh, processed, processed yes, by things that we perceive as, physical objects and that reminded me of this concept that i've talked about before especially in terms of like what is everything really is that we are really that, that we live in a universe of pure information i know i knew that was coming <laughs> i knew it <laughs> yes <laughs> i'm sure you saw it coming. i saw that one coming <laughs> But so many times I've but said I, but that, that's and you're like, what do you mean? But that's and because I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> but this is what's happening. Because I know the formation history of that statement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, the other thing I would point out, that I, and I didn't realize this at the time, but now that you bring up Feynman, that this is a beautiful theory because it's something new and also very simple in yeah. terms of its its – the, the the fundamental idea of it is, yeah. is simple, even though the paper is like ridiculously complex. I think it's because he's trying to go into the description of how it works. Yeah. But the base mechanism of just like you just look at the object and how it combines with other objects is it's like yeah. simple. Yes. It's it's the the great thing about it is it doesn't change anything. He's just saying he, he's saying like here's a different way to look at these processes that may help us understand what's actually going on. And maybe make some predictions, right? But the other thing he does in there is he talks about predictions. He's like, Pfft. I love you know, that. You know, he's just like, no, this is, you know, you can, the two, the, there are two vastly different things asking about the weather in New York next week versus asking about the weather in New York yesterday. Yeah. These are two vastly different things. And that is why he's saying, you know, the, the universe is not big enough to contain the future. Because the possibilities for the weather in New York next week are enormous. But the weather in New York yesterday is known. Finite. Yes. It is one thing, right? I mean, it's a big, complicated system, but you can still say, here's what it was. But all the possibilities for it, what it might be next week, is, is you know, is, is massive. And so the universe itself isn't big enough to contain it. It hasn't made the computations yet. Yeah. It doesn't have – New York's weather next week does not have its formation history complete. Yeah. This is why it's cool. And so when you begin to look at everything in that way, you can see like, ah, oh, yeah, any object must contain its formation history. Anything that's in the future doesn't have its formation history completed yet. It hasn't been computed by these tiny things in the universe like electrons and positrons and – Neutrinos and whatever else, all the different forces that are acting on a, a, the trillions of particles that are, you know, all these little things that Feynman was talking about. Yeah. Here's what does the basic computation for the universe, all of the interactions of these tiny little things. Those are the computations that take place. That is what is the formation history. We need another, New York needs another week. The whole planet has to have another week of computation before we know what New York's weather will be next right. week.
<clears throat> the whole universe. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Because, yeah. Some, right. Yes, Jupiter is going to have an effect on New York's weather. Rock lands in New York from space. <laughs> <laughs> That's New York's you're right. weather yeah. next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. <clears throat> and this, and, and there was one other thing that was interesting, uh, was the the idea of determinism versus uh what's the other not determinism <laughs> oh so he was talking about uh free will yeah like this there was something interesting about yeah the idea. it's like is like do we have do we have <laughs> destiny or free will right determinism versus free will yeah is everything set is new york's weather next week set somewhere in stone or is it possible that it's you know that it that it's variable that we yeah don't, so yeah. the the idea that cuz cuz there is this idea that that there is determinism and things are basically set uh but because this idea says that the future is essentially too much information for the universe at this time it cannot be determinism yeah. and that is why free will exists yeah so there's all these weird yeah, branches, philosophical, the, philosophical yeah. ideas that it goes off of based on this. It's cool. Yeah. And I think that, you know, some <clears throat> concepts of uh, quantum mechanics also imply this, right? That 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 there is uh, uncertainty. Uncertainty. And I think he does yeah. mention this, but it's sort of a way of explaining it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, I'm starting to lose lose track here. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, okay. So I have a a couple of other papers here about archaeology that I found quite interesting and had never heard of this before. But there are uh, there is an archaeological site under the water in Lake Huron. And I don't remember the exact depth, but it's like a hundred meter or a hundred feet or over a hundred feet underwater. And the last time that was dry land was like 9,000 years ago. Yeah. And they've found basically uh, rock structures under there. So I had heard, I, I had seen something about this called online, like, uh, Stonehenge found, yes, you know, yeah, underwater in one of the Great Lakes or something. It's not a Stonehenge, it's not a circle, it's not hinges. Uh, but I, I was trying to figure out where this came from and ultimately found these papers. So I'm going to go through uh, a couple of them. And let's see, let me pull them up. Which one was I going to do? I think it was this one. <clears throat> okay, so the paper is titled A 9,000-Year-Old Caribou Hunting Structure Beneath Lake Huron by John M. O'Shea. I'm uh, not sure how to pronounce his name at all. This is from April 28, 2014. <clears throat> and the abstract... Let's see, should I do the abs? Yeah. Uh, it says, some of the most pivotal questions in human hist history necessitate the investigation of archaeological sites that are now underwater. 9,000 years ago, the Alpena Amberley Ridge, or AAR, beneath modern Lake Huron was a dry land corridor that connected northeast Michigan to southern Ontario. The newly discovered Drop 45 Drive Lane, which is the name of this site is the most complex hunting structure found to date beneath the Great Lakes. The site and its associated artifacts provide unprecedented insight into the social and seasonal organization of prehistoric caribou hunting. When combined with environmental and simulation studies, it is suggested that distinctly different seasonal strategies were used by early hunters on the AAR with autumn hunting being carried out by small groups and spring hunts being conducted by larger groups of cooperating hunters. Um, forgive me, but this 
<clears throat> for some reason, this article repeats things over and over, so mm. I have to kind of, uh, it like repeats that first paragraph again. Um, so let's see here. The advance and retreat of the glacial ice throughout the period of human development and dispersal and the associated global changes in sea level repeatedly exposed and then submerged significant coastal land masses. As a result, questions as diverse as the origins of early human culture, the spread of hominids out of Africa, and the colonization of the New World all hinge on evidence that is underwater. Although the discovery and investigation of such sites presents methodological challenges, these contexts also have a unique potential for preserving ancient sites without disturbance from later human occupation. The Alpina Amberley Ridge, AAR, beneath modern Lake Huron in, North Amer in the North American Great Lakes provides just such a setting and offers unique evidence of prehistoric caribou hunters. <clears throat> During the Lake Stanley Low Stand, 11,500 to 7,000 calibrated years before present, lake levels were as much as 100 meters lower than present, and the AAR was a dry, narrow land corridor extending from northern Michigan to south-central Ontario. Research on the AAR by a multidisciplinary team of archaeologists, environmental scientists, maritime engineers, and computer scientists has created a model of this ancient landscape and the movement of caribou across it. Given the mid-lake location of the AAR, which is 56 kilometers from the modern shore, there is little recent sediment cover of the archaeological materials, hmm. and preserved ancient sediments contain a range of environmental indicators, including pollen, testate amoeba, charcoal, preserved wood, and trees. The presence of distinct marsh testate amoeba assemblages, I don't know what testate amoebas are, but anyways, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and moss spores indicates that the AAR was a stable land surface that was rapidly flooded after 8,000 years before present and has remained relatively intact without significant further sedimentation since inundation. So that's awesome. I mean, it's like an 8,000-year-old yeah. site underwater that hasn't been covered in sediment. It's just, it's been <laughs> preserved. It's way out in the middle. Yeah. Because of the rapid flooding of the area, after that, the, the sedimentation is on the, is near the shores. Near this the thing's 50-something yeah. kilometers from the shore. If it had flooded slowly, yeah, it would have been covered in sediment. Yeah. <clears throat> like flooded by multiple inundations over and over, you know, over thousands of years, it would yeah. have just been covered. So this this is that's that's awesome that's an awesome <laughs> paragraph to me. Yeah. Uh and and it, what's interesting is that in earlier paper they talk about a gradual flooding of this landscape. And so this paper coming later is like it yeah. was rapid. Yeah. There's no sedimentation. They can still find pollens from the time. There's, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's almost no sedimentation at all. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Paleo environmental analysis indicates that the area was a subarctic environment consisting of sphagnum moss, uh, taramac larch, which is a tree, spruce trees, along with small lakes, rivers, and wetlands. Radiocarbon dates on preserved wood yielded dates from 8,900 to 8,640 calibrated years before present, whereas charcoal recovered from the middle of a circle of small stones yielded a date of 9,000 and 20 years calibrated before present. The environment that emerges from these studies is one that would have been ideal for migrating caribou and for their human pursuers. Humans and caribou have a long history of interaction, dating back to at least the Middle Paleolithic. Over time, caribou hunters and herders became aware of the tendency of caribou, like many undulates, to follow linear features. As such... The construction of linear features of stone or brush provides an effective means of channeling the movement of animals into predetermined kill zones. Numerous historical and ethnographic examples of these hunting structures and associated features are known in the Arctic. In more temperate regions of the globe, traces of such structures rarely survive intact. What is known of caribou hunting in the Great Lakes region is based on stone tool technology, 
archaeological site locations, and the very rare preservation of faunal materials. The submerged character of the AAR offers both the potential for preserving these structures that do not survive in the terrestrial archaeological record and for their discovery via acoustic survey techniques. Since 2008, more than 60 stone constructions on the AAR have been identified and visually inspected within two targeted research areas. I'd love to see what they look like. <laughs> There's some pictures. <clears throat> Targets of potential, uh, of potential interest identified during acoustic survey are examined via video provided by a remote operational vehicle and, if warranted, are directly mapped and sampled by self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, SCUBA, <laughs> trained archaeologists. To distinguish human-modified features from natural occurrences, the form and setting of each structure is assessed to determine whether it is part of a shore or ice thrust feature or geologic formation, and to identify repeated non-random patterns of construction. The environmental context, position on the landscape, and presence of associated cultural material is also evaluated for each potential structure. This process mirrors the practices used to identify terrestrial hunting structures. Following these criteria, the identified cultural structures on the AAR range from simple small V-shaped hunting blinds to more complex features with stone drive lanes, multiple hunting blinds, and associated structures. Although other prey species were certainly pursued by late Paleo-Indian and early Archaic foragers, caribou would have represented the main prey species given the environmental conditions on the AAR and were likely the target for the constructed stone features. The discovery of the Drop 45 drive lane and its associated artifacts described here provides unprecedented insight into prehistoric hunting in the Great Lakes region during a poorly known period of time. Uh, so <clears throat> they think these are 9,000 years old? Is that what yes, you're saying? Yes, the charcoal remains from within a stone circle, 9,000 years old. Um, let's see. I believe it said the... Okay, so here's a description. I wonder if they look similar to the, some of the stuff we find in the Northeast, you know, these walls. Yes, dude. Yeah. This is what I, there are some pictures of this, of the stones. And, and then there's a, there's a, um, a sonar survey or whatever. And yeah. you can see they're showing you like all these long yeah. <laughs> walls. And then there's another wall that sort of slowly converges, converges with, it. Yeah. with it. And then there's little stands mm. of rock. They call yeah. them blinds. blinds, and they're they're toppled over. So there's yeah. like a little pile, a cir circular pile of stones. Yeah, but it was just enough to just hide somebody there, and yeah. the and the caribou are just following this linear, yeah, line, and they get trapped. So let's. <clears throat> this is, I believe, the description of the stone structures, uh, and they call it the Drop Forty Five Drive Lane, which is. <laughs> You know, that's that's a great name. <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> I mean it's just cool. You could I mean this is a band name or something. I don't know. Yeah. It does sound like a band name. <clears throat> so the drop forty five drive lane is located near the top of the slope, but below the crest. It is bounded by a raised cobble pavement on the west and a marsh to the east. The feature is constructed on level limestone bedrock and is comprised of two parallel lines of stones leading toward an effective cul-de-sac formed by the natural cobble pavement. The stone lane is 8 meters wide and 30 meters long. The drive lane has three associated circular hunting blinds that are built into the stone lines and a series of perpendicular flanking lines on its west side. To the northwest of the drive lane and on top of the raised cobble feature are additional stone alignments that may also have served as blinds and obstructions for cor corralling caribou. Further to the northwest is a low boggy swale, and beyond that, a second crest, which is populated by a perpendicular arrangement of boulders. Taking all these elements together, the total length of the area within which caribou would have been ambushed is roughly 100 meters in length and 28 meters wide. And so they have here... A, uh, you can see this image here. I know you guys can't see it, but they've it's just oh, kind yeah, of like okay. a simple drawing of all the standing stones and, and, yeah. and drive lanes. So this is like the main corridor 
and there's yeah, you blinds can see a wide thing, a long main corridor. Yeah, <clears throat> and there's some some imaging of, oh, the, yeah. of the stones. Wow, and there's like a cul-de-sac. Uh, Man, so, how tall would you have to make it to trap the caribou? Can't they jump? I wonder if they were really tall walls. I don't know. We the, should take a break too. Oh, okay. All right. More on this yeah. after the break. Yeah. Once again, we are almost always wrong, almost all the time, ladies and gentlemen, especially when discussing things like assembly theory. <laughs> but now we are diving into these papers about this these structures beneath one of the great drop lakes. Drop 45 drive lane. Yeah, folks. the old drop 45 drive lane. 9,000 years old uh, hunting structures. Kind of reminds me of some of the stuff that has been found in, uh, in the deserts in, is it Syria? There's a whole... I mean, there's hundreds of these structures, little round things. Some of them look like keyholes. Some of them are just long, narrow, mm. and they don't seem to have any definable purpose. They're not big enough to be towns or villages. They're too big to be houses, but they're just like circles or all these strange shapes, triangles and stuff. And like a lot of people have, some people, I should say, have wondered if they have to do with hunting. Mm. So, but I mean, it not seems like a lot of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this I've, is I've you figured never out this is heard of like this. over a hundred feet down. Yeah, it's hundred and twenty one feet down, thirty seven meters underwater right now, this this particular site, the drop forty five drive lane. Um that's a long way down there. Yeah. Yeah, so some of you may know we are we're getting our dive certifications, and I think after we get our open water certification, we have a couple more dives to do before we're fully certified, but it's only gonna be sixty feet. That's the floor. Yeah. So we have to go back to do the deep water certification to be able to dive this deep. I mean, yeah. he told us, he's like, I mean, you know, you can dive wherever. I mean, there's no <laughs> dive police down there. <laughs> but you get down there, excuse me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> You're too deep. Yeah. This is just about, you know, your own personal safety. But Yeah, which I didn't Yeah, we, about, we I respect. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't. We've never done anything that we're not qualified for no. that's very dangerous. Of course not. Ever. No. Not ever. Not once. <laughs> it is weird though when you're like this idea that like you put on this this apparatus and then you go down there and you're trapped. Yeah. <laughs> like the like the the instructor is just like, "Look, the safest place for you is underwater." Yeah, that's right. Like do not, especially in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah, do yeah. not go charging up to the surface like if right. you get freaked out. Like yeah. you have to always think like if you if you feel like something's going wrong, Remember, the safest place is underwater. Yeah. It's just a, it's it's a, a weird, strange yeah. <laughs> thing to Because your immediate your... thing is like, I got to go up. Yeah. But no, that's how you get yourself killed. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. it is like you're trapped in this, in this, I mean, tiny little, you've just got this little device, this tube. Yeah. To a, to a tank. Yeah. And that's, there's that's one, it. there's one particular kind of uh, emergency ascent that he's teaching us that is specifically geared towards the fact that you are going to die on your way up. Yeah. And it's like, here's, well, how it's, it's, here's how you do it so that, you know, if you breathe water and pass out or whatever, you fall unconscious because you're out of air or whatever, you do the ascent in this particular way so that when you surface, you're floating in the right way to where you could breathe, maybe, yeah. if you're, you know, if, if your, like, automatic reflexes kick in. Uh, but otherwise, and that you are least likely to die from the bubbles, right, in your blood. That's right. Yeah, the nitrogen bubbles. Yeah, yeah. but it's basically like you pull your weights, you get in this particular position, and then you lay back and you wait to die. <laughs> but you're you only do that when your only other option is you're dying down there. Right. That's it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. Okay. Your two options are to die, and to die. <laughs> 
one of them on the surface, the other one at the bottom. Yeah, one of them, you <laughs> might perhaps get a proper burial. <laughs> yes, yeah. I guess the two options are disappear without a trace or die from drowning. <laughs> so yeah, it is interesting to to do this. But yeah, so we, we would need our deep water certificate. But it'd be great to die on hey, these. But, but look, the other option is just get renting a, a submersible yeah. and just driving it, you know, a, a drone and, and Oh, not like drive. a you don't want to rent like No, a, I mean not a I don't want to <laughs> You don't want a submarine a PS three controlled <laughs> not Dang something it. I'm getting inside I of. Can, I can totally control it. <laughs> I'm talking about is this too soon? I don't know. <laughs> Give me um, a keyboard and mouse and we'll be fine. <laughs> I'm talking about a drone. <laughs> yeah. An underwater drone. Right. Could just an ROV. Yeah. ROV, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so to so to wrap this up, I mean just the the papers anyway um last thing i'll do is the is from this paper uh is about some of the artifacts de de described um aside from the structure itself um systematic sampling along the length of the lane yielded a total of 11 chipped stone flakes <laughs> <laughs> underwater archaeology is hard yeah these flakes exhibited sharp edges and elements of standard flake morphology and cultural manufacture, such as platforms, bulbs of percussion, and crushing. Anybody who does flint napping will, yeah. should be familiar. Seven flakes were located in the southern opening of the drive lane, and two of each were found in two of the associated hunting blinds. So anyway, they go on to go into many details about these flakes, chirts, uh, Blah blah blah. I don't, I don't really need to get into that, but that leads me to another paper, which is called Central Oregon Obsidian from Submerged Early Holocene Archaeological Site Beneath Lake Huron. Uh, and this was a 2021 paper by same guy, John M. O'Shea. Obsidian, this is the abstract. Obsidian, originating from the Rocky Mountains in the West, was an exotic exchange commodity in eastern North America that was often deposited in elaborate caches and burials associated with Middle Woodland era Hopewell and later complexes. In earlier times, obsidian is found only rarely. In this paper, we report two obsidian flakes recovered from a now-submerged paleo landscape beneath Lake Huron that are conclusively attributed to the wagon tire, wagon tire obsidian source in central Oregon, a distance of more than 4,000 kilometers. Wow. These specimens, dating to 9,000 BP before present, represent the earliest and most distant reported occurrence of obsidian in eastern North America. So he goes on to describe some obsidian. Uh, it was traded widely throughout much of human history. It has a unique and identifiable chemical signature. It's played an important role in the documentation and analysis of ancient exchange networks in places as diverse as the Arctic, the Eastern Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, and Mexico. Within the continental United States and Canada and provinces, the Principal source of obsidian is found in the Pacific Northwest as far east as South Dakota and in the Southwest, particularly in Arizona and New Mexico. While the use of obsidian is ubiquitous in, to the West, in the West, the pattern of archaeological occurrences east of the Rocky Mountains follows a distinct chronological pattern with obsidian appearing late as an important exotic good in the middle woodland Hopewell complex, but only very sporadically before this. Earlier occurrences are scattered across the plains and further east, but tend to be represented by a very small numbers of flakes found within late archaic and early woodland contexts. So, given this established pattern of spatial and chronological distribution, the discovery of two obsidian flakes attributable to 9,000 years before present from the bottom of Lake Huron is unprecedented. The fact that both specimens are unambiguously derived from the wagon tire source in central Oregon, a distance of 4,000 kilometers, is extraordinary. These specimens represent the oldest and farthest east confirmed occurrence of Western obsidian in the continental United States. So in this report, they document the context of the find, describe the specimens, and present the detailed compositional data that allows specimens to be linked to their central organ source, which we don't 
have to get into, but it's just like so. Is the implication that this was traded these that were, far, yeah, or like that the, these so people carried it? Traded is what they would suggest, but the you know the point is is that like uh, you know we're just talking about this. In other words, these people were well connected. Yeah, if they brought it there themselves then you know they traveled vast distances if they were traded then there was just a trading network that, yeah that you spanned know. half the u.s so more than half the u.s i just i know these are you know it's like a couple of flakes of obsidian but i just th this kind of stuff to me is just like this window into the possible uh sophistication of the people that lived at that time you've got yeah. this stone structure they had you know they had construction abilities they were moving heavy stones they had strategies they engineered yep kill like these these uh complex kill sites they were trading across the continent yeah <clears throat> and if you think about it, it's nine thousand years and they're down in this basin right Presumably near the Proto Lake. Well, yeah. So at the time, this 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 drop lane that we're talking about is actually a ridge. Mm. It's a high prominence, and the lake would have been on either side. Think uh, of like, okay. think of like, uh, you know, it's like it's almost like a uh, a peninsula yeah, or an peninsula. island. It's a, it's it's connect. It's like an isthmus between two lakes. Okay. So when the lake later filled up, this is now in the middle of the lake because the two lakes joined each other. Yeah, okay. So it's this, they could drive the caribou into this narrow passage between these two lakes, and they built these structures there to kill them. Hmm. So it shows that these people were organized, that they were at least doing something at a scale that was going to be, because you're not going to be some little band of like a few guys nomads yeah doing kills like at this scale i would i would assume yeah this is going to be to provide for a community right um, yeah to provide enough meat for a large group of people yeah and then you combine that with the fact that they're trading with people four thousand kilometers away this is i just i just love this you know this is a, a like they said in the paper like a little known uh period human activity we just don't know a whole lot about what people were doing at this time and so this this site is just so well preserved down there underwater it's just awesome yeah so yeah i don't remember what it was i was looking for but if you see um stonehenge under under the great lakes that that's that's what this is referring to <laughs> <laughs> most of the news stories are completely wrong it's like <laughs> Like uh, Agent Stone. There was some other story we read a long time ago about these guys who were out fishing, and the, remember, and then his paddle hits something. Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be a pyramid. Yeah, under the water. Yeah. Yeah. What was that? I don't know. Yeah. It's probably probably there's probably some paper there that was like, you know, pile of pile yeah. of rocks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything's a pyramid. <laughs> I mean. Like that that gigantic hill in in Mexico or whatever. Yeah. It turns out you know it's yeah it's actually one of the biggest pyramids in the world. Right. It just looks Cholula. like a, looks yeah. like a hill. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It's who knows. Yeah. Well, that's that's all interesting stuff. Shall we wrap it up? Are we done? Uh. Well, it's, I mean, I just we're realized like thirteen minutes into the yeah, I know, and I just a couple of emails. I just realized that I'm looking at this. Well, you just have to pause it for a second and give me a chance here to to find something. Okay, all right. Well, I've found some emails. Um, so let's see. This one is from Adam. It's called "All the Random Organic Crap Raining from the Sky." <laughs> if we knew the Earth was going to get wiped out and we couldn't escape. Might we try to reseed life here for the future generations that might survive underground? How might we do that? Cryogenically freeze seeds, fish eggs, amphibian eggs, bird eggs, earthworms, and any other small creatures that might not die if they rain from the sky. Launch thousands of pods into orbit with planned thaw, grow, and drop rates thousands of years in the future. Mm. Some might work, 
They reseed the land, lakes, and oceans, and maybe even the air. Others might not work so great. Fish drop over land, birds run out of food or don't get hatched before they're dropped. Re-entry miscalculations and whole pods of critters just burn up on re-entry. Only some of the banana pups hit islands throughout the South Pacific and the rest just land in the ocean. I feel like this combined with digging deep caves, carving knowledge into stone, and building pyramids would be a pretty responsible use of resources if we were certain we were all screwed. P.S. Also for sure we would drop snakes! (laughs) (laughs) Some of these pods, things went terribly wrong and it turns into a big pile of sludge which then (laughs) rained down somewhere. (laughs) Yes. Just, yeah. Just nasty meat sludge. (laughs) (laughs) That's actually really cool. Uh, I love this. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. That's a great, that's a great possibility. Uh, Okay. This is from, uh, this is from our buddy Bruce Wayne. Hey. (laughs) Russ and Kyle. The other day I rediscovered a 1970 account of little people from Birmingham, England. It is documented in a song as wide as a widely distributed story. Fairies Wear Boots, album Paranoid Band Black Sabbath, 1970. <laughs> Please make sure that the Drew learns of this evidence. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Fairies Wear Boots. <laughs> Skyscraper Glass. This is from uh, Butt Flapper Heimer right. von Schland. You need some skyscraper glass, <laughs> Dear bro? Snake Bros, plant those skyscraper windows in the ground in a circle and call it Glass Hinge. <laughs> if it gets too popular and doesn't cause too many wildfires, sell Glass Hinge merch and charge five bucks to use the restroom. Instant retirement. Just a tip from an old fart boomer. In short, a paleo methylator graph Butt Flapper Heimer von Schland. P.S. I had, again, prepared some unsolicited advice about driving into the paranormal podcast ditch, but it got too long. (laughs) See, he's very respectful. He knows I don't want to read books. (laughs) What was this, uh, method later? Uh, (laughs) uh, What does it say? An old fart boomer, in short, a paleo... Methylator. Methylator. Yeah. (laughs) Old fart boomer. (laughs) Genius. I love it. <laughs> yeah, and some unsolicited advice about driving into the... Par- he, so he says these these paranormal podcasts are just like dead ends. Uh, they don't go anywhere. You know, people are just endlessly looking at cases and things, and it just eventually you're just like, okay, I've heard all this a million times. Like, mm. are we going to do anything with mm. this information? And I think he, Assembly was, theory. he was a little worried with some of the UFO episodes that we might be starting to drive into the paranormal podcast ditch. But I think he came around after, you know, because we keep going and he's like, okay, you're not driving into the ditch. You're just pointing out, look at these ditches. Uh, Okay. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) If I've got that wrong, you can let me know. But Flapperheimer von Schland. Okay. This is uh, from Casper, the friendly milkman. Hey, lovable bros, I've listened to episode 300 and 301, so I've caught up. We all know the true number, of course. Loved it, as always, and loved the previous one, too, on the Akashic Records. Kyle, you are an amazing artist, and you proved it again with your finishing track. (laughs) Also, I'm I'm really excited that there is more esoteric content, as that is the thing I'm very interested in. See, he's the opposite. He wants the paranormal podcast ditch. Lately, I've not been sleeping much and had... And had rumbling flow of thoughts, too. There's an idea that thoughts come to us from the spirit world, you know? That's why many therapists recommend writing your journal, what you do, what you want to do in the future, etc. I personally don't do it, but it can help with anxiety, apparently. So the other night, I wrote something which kind of flew through my mind when I was about to fall asleep. And he quotes his writing here. We're all beautiful souls going through a human physical body experience. Some of us go through addictions and other disorders. Some are humble and chilled, focusing on perfecting their bodies by eating healthy, fasting, and exercising. Angels and demons are real. They reside in the spirit world. They influence our choices. You can take it as their battle or think of it in terms of balancing everything in this crazy universe. The wisdom and stupidity, the ignorant and the interested, everybody makes a choice. Like the hermetic principle, as above, so below, as within, so without. It is what it is. What will be, will be. None of that matters. And all of that matters. All is connected, and all seems so separate. 
I've heard also that the basis of our existence is some kind of paradox, but our small brains can't really wrap any reason around it. In my mind, the definition of paradox is as follows. Two statements opposite to each other, and both of them are true. Now a question. Do you think that we come here, or incarnate, to experience duality and make the right choices? Apparently, a planet Earth is a unique place, and it was created just for that purpose. Anyway, love your creativity and how you contemplate on all those ideas. I even get goosebumps from time to time. Keep up the good work, keep laughing, and best of luck to you and your family. From Casper. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. So, yeah. are we? Do we incarnate here to make choices? He says the right choices. Or maybe that's the test, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I, I tend to like the idea that, uh, that I don't know if this is, I don't know where, to, where the boundaries of this are, but maybe life or sentience, uh, sentient beings are like the, the attempt of the universe or the create creative force or whatever to observe itself, mm. right? Because like, it's like a way of experiencing its own creation. Yeah. I don't know. I just I kind of like that idea. It's it's maybe. I'm not like saying that that's what I believe, but it's it's a it's interesting to me. So Are the we, more the the like you could see this path of of life becoming more and more complex and getting these more and more uh, complicated receptors to perceive the energetic happenings within the universe, and and that is the attempt of like slowly like building upon itself. Like I want to look at this, look at my own creation more. Yeah, you know. To experience it in more and more ways, you know, can we? Are we going? Can we go full Lovecraft on this? Yeah, like the star <laughs> itself is also doing this yeah, in, a, okay. in a way. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> then all we have to do is summon Nyarlathotep. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just. <laughs> hey, that reminds me though. The Boltzmann brain was brought up in that. Yeah, they did bring up the yeah, Boltzmann he's brain. Like, yeah, he's like, is, I don't like this. Yeah, either. he's like, this is this is not possible yeah like with, with assembly theory yeah. or whatever i don't remember how he got there yeah this i'm sorry but the the lovecraft takes that idea right this idea that we are the we are a method the for result. the universe to experience itself yeah. and it kind of takes that idea and and you know turns it into Wait, this lovecraftian nightmare are you saying that i didn't come up with that idea <laughs> no no, no. <laughs> yeah <laughs> this I, is uh unfortunately i, I ripped somebody off <laughs> no you just uh <laughs> Maybe it was a completely independent. It has its own formation history, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. This concept is like the universe. All of this universe that we experience is actually the dream of this giant, this massive being in this other realm. Ah, yes. Right, and he wants to. He's sleeping, right? But he wants to also experience his dream from the inside, and so he's been like manipulating the universe to generate yeah. life. And then he needs to, but he needs the life that's here now to summon him, to open a, a portal, and pull Aha! him in, right? <laughs> and of course, typical Lovecraft—that means death and madness for everyone if that happens. So, this is what the guy in, was doing on drugs in the desert. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was a he was a tool. Of yeah. Whatever this dude's yeah. complicated as a name thought. <laughs> Yeah. Nyarlathotep is is as a thoth's avatar in this realm. Who is his whole goal is to summon as a thoth through the, yeah, into the in, to, to waken the dreamer. Uh, oof, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> now I'm gonna get Lovecraft people like that's completely wrong. Yeah, it's probably not totally right. Sorry, Let's just remember we're almost always wrong almost all the time. But yeah, these are good questions. I don't know. It's it, it, Going back to this, like this concept of like, is are we here for some kind of test, or is it some kind of growing thing? I mean, we've discussed this with Laird Scranton, and you know, is is I I I kind of think this idea is cool that uh, that you know I don't it's none of this stuff is things I can believe right because I, I don't, I'm not at a level where I'm just like yes sort of agnostic this is true yeah 
but this concept that we all have higher selves, which can be equated to like our true self is in some other realm and it is incarnating pieces of itself here by injecting a tiny bit of itself, which would be the soul or whatever you want to call it, that inhabits, animates. Like the, a thread. Yeah. The human body. A thread with a very limited uh, data. Yeah. L low uh, bandwidth. Low bandwidth. That's <laughs> yeah. right. So it's like, we're here and we're like, it's like, man, there seems to be something more. That's the low bandwidth. Yeah. And, and I like the idea that the higher self is can be a combination of all these ideas of there's the guardian angel, there's this spirit that watches over you, yeah. there's this there's idea this of thing God that knowing knows everything. every hair, hair yeah, on your yeah. head and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you, right? Is it you? Is it your God self? Whatever. I don't know. But, and then maybe all these little synchronicities, you know, when you're doing something and you're kind of going along the right path, all these synchronicities are your, could be your higher self sort of poking at the fabric of reality. God is in Every one of you. Yeah. Right? Like this is, I mean, it's even, you know, you can look at the Christian tradition and see yeah. in so many ways the way it, the way these ideas are presented could be, this is one interpretation. Yeah. Your body is a temple for what? Yes. For this sliver of yourself, yeah. this Osiris sliver, <laughs> this fragment of your, of your higher self. And are you here to make the right choices? What does that mean? You know? Uh, I don't know, like, are we, or are we here to somehow go through an experience that can cause the higher self to become more than it is right now? In other words, it can increase its own uh, list of experiences. Yeah. Or, yeah, its own formation history is increased by injecting a tiny bit of itself into this material uh, vessel. Yeah. I don't know. I like them. I like them. I like the ideas. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> what else we got here? I also like uh, materialist reductionist universe, and uh, there's no meaning at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't. I actually don't like that. So these are my biases. <laughs> that one is boring. Yeah. To me. Yeah. Just totally uninspiring and boring. Yes. So I. I tend to gravitate towards these other ideas, even though like they're not testable. They're, they can't be. It's like I don't see a way that science can can look at this. Uh, but nevertheless, it intrigues me. It inspires me. Whereas the the other path is completely uninspiring. So that is my bias. Yes. And I, you know, I'm fine with that. This is my bias. I'm interested in these in these other possible ways that are completely untestable, but uh they're preferable. Yeah. I agree. The my bias is towards the stuff that's interesting <laughs> as opposed to the stuff that's just like, well, it doesn't mean anything. It's all by yeah. chance. So everything is boring. Yeah. So what <laughs> you know, what what is there to gain? Uh, by not pursuing the the interesting part that's not testable, you know, by by just resigning to the idea that well, you know, we can't test it, therefore it's not. Well, if if the concept that it's all meaningless somehow comforts you for some reason, then maybe that's the reason. I that don't know. could be. I I think that, you know, comfort might be the wrong word, right? That makes it seem. Well, look, if but it's it, like if you're it, basically if, saying my bias is what's interesting. Maybe some people find it fascinating. Look, that it, there's no purpose, no reason to any of this, and it's all just what it is. Yeah. If if at the end, uh, and when I die, there there is nothing more. Yeah. I have lost nothing. Yeah. By pursuing these. Except you've lived your whole life as a lie. Yeah, but what? It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. It doesn't That's matter because it, it makes matters. no difference. So yeah. it's like I'll hedge my bets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a, what is that? That's some kind of thought experiment. I'm like, why not? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, so this is from. This is from Richard. Uh, and this is an interesting one, and I think maybe we'll 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 wrap it up with this one. But I debated multiple times, Richard, on whether to read this on the show. But I I want to, because this is it's good. Okay, so this is, uh, it's called Thank You. 
to Russ and Kyle or whomever, whomever reads these first. Please read this through before you just trash it. I'm going to message Ben and Randall as well, just in case. The reason I'm messaging, as I've never done anything like this before, is because my family was diagnosed with a rare genetic mutation that causes stomach cancer in 80% of us and a 50% chance of passing it on. Eight out of 11 of my immediate family have had our stomachs completely removed. Because of the surgery and treatments, I needed a lot of time off work and lost my career. I also couldn't really do the job anymore anyway due to health concerns. My sister didn't get the surgery in time and it spread to her brain. I spent a lot of time down staying with her and taking care of her. I first saw Randall on Rogan, followed the rabbit hole to you through Cosmo, and then to Ben. When my sister passed, I went through a terrible depression, started drinking too much. I thought I'd lost everything. My job, my baby sister, who was my best friend. I couldn't eat like a normal person. I lost my zest for life. I basically became an alcoholic, just wanting to hide from the world. My wife ended up leaving me. I lost multiple, multiple shit jobs. I was just spinning out. Ended up going to rehab and stopped drinking, and I wish I could say I've been with you all since the beginning, but I started getting into all of this to distract me and give me something to ponder. I was also always fascinated with all this a long time ago in my 20s, and I was into ancient aliens, but mostly like you stated, just because it was so much cool stuff I'd never seen or heard about. The aliens, not so much, but I never count anything out. But I feel homo whatever species are amazing creatures, and it discredits what our ancestors were capable of. Anyway... I digress. I just wanted to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. In a weird way, you guys all saved my life by giving me something to help me through the hardest times. I just wanted you all to know how much of an impact you have had on a 40-some-year-old guy you have never met in the middle of Illinois. Sorry for rambling, and thanks again. Sincerely, Richie. Oh, my God, Richie. Thank you, man. Brother. Holy crap. Yep. Right in the fields, warms and fuzzies, bro. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you from the bottom of my heart, and sorry for your loss. And, uh, wow, that's... <sighs> so, Richie, that applies to what we were just talking about. You know, this concept of, like, why? Like, is it all meaningless, or is it more interesting to study this whole concept from the interesting idea that it does have meaning that there is some reason right that all of this is worth something that you're going through these things that these things happen and they do have a purpose however badly sometimes the you know the experiences we go through might cause us to suffer like do we learn from them do we grow from them somehow is there some higher purpose right your higher self is doing this or is there a creator or a god or is there some kind of hierarchy of any kind? Or maybe it's just the universe itself, but there is some purpose to it. It's not meaningless, right? And so, yes, giving, having these things to ponder can help you through hard times because you can sort of step out of very difficult times and look at the wider universe and realize, like, man, there's all this mystery. There's all this interesting stuff out there. There are reasons to keep going and to keep thinking about these things. Amen, brother. Damn. What he said, Richie. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, man. God yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sending that, man. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. And to all the emailers, we really appreciate all the emails. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, shorter version. Uh, there's uh, this is our Christmas show. Do we have uh, we have some producers? Yes, we do. Yeah. We have. Um, well, heck with it. I'm gonna just. Go ahead and say this is an associate executive producer. Yeah. It's uh, $30. Appreciate it so much. This is from David Cree. Uh, David Cree says, love the podcast. Thank you. I write and illustrate children's books, and I'm currently working on the second book about how dragons are found throughout history, from Chichen Itza to Marduk versus Tiamat. SimonMyPetDragon.com. Wow. Snacks. Cool. And I went I went to the website, Simon, S-I-M-O-N, mypetdragon.com and yeah he's he's got this book up it's available on Amazon oh wow cool children's book uh, very cool dude maybe he should talk to Laura they're doing the Snake Bros Kids thing yeah she's working on uh, doing some children's episodes about these interesting mysteries and that yeah. sounds like right up the alley yeah so. exactly um, appreciate that so much thank you for the donation thank you um, and of course our favorite Anne Who Knits Anne Who Knits 
uh, with a $200 executive producer donation. Thank you so much, Anne. And she says, happy solstice, everyone. Hope you enjoy holidays, birthdays, and assorted adventures. <laughs> <laughs> sorted or assorted? Assorted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we she love you, Anne. She thinks our adventures are sorted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. All right, guys. Kyle needs to go lay down. Ow. Take more drugs. <laughs> 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 Uh, we'll talk to you guys next year. We love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work.